Welcome to the .NET Talk Show with your hosts, Cam Soper, David Pye, and not the Scott we deserve, but the Scott we needed, Scott Addy. The .NET Doc Show starts now. I'm pointing and no one's saying anything. That was your cue, guys. Not saying anything. <laughs> We're live. We're frozen. We're live. We're frozen, Cam. So many, so many unknowns. This is a big day for us, though, right? So oh for, luck. for folks who have tuned in, um, Ed Charbonneau has brought us good luck. And this is now our debut on the Learn TV platform. Um, Ed, why don't you introduce yourself for folks who aren't familiar? Sure, Scott. I am a senior advocate with makers of the Teller QI components. And I specialize right now in the Teller QI for Blazor uh, component library. I'm also a Microsoft MVP, and I've been doing this development stuff for nearly 20 years now. So I'm getting pretty good at it. So I'm curious, Ed, how did you get into Blazor? What was it that uh, lured you into that sector in the ASP.NET Core community? Well, so I've been doing uh, ASP.NET uh, since .NET 2 days. So it's been quite a while. I've been doing web forms and all of those things and uh, migrated over to MVC. And I was uh, lucky enough to be at the M MVP Summit in, uh, in Redmond about three years ago. And uh, Steve Sanderson was out there and he was doing a demo of a new framework that he was working on called Blazor. And it was showing how to do client-side development with C Sharp and not using JavaScript for everything. And uh, there was literally a room full of MVPs doing a standing ovation for the demos, which is something that I, I don't think I've seen but once. <laughs> so I, I thought it was going to be pretty big. You know, these you know Microsoft MVPs are, are generally people that that know their tech, and if they're doing standing ovations for it, then uh, you know it's going to be pretty interesting. Yeah, uh, much respect to Steve Sanderson. If you're not familiar with the name, he's uh, the guy who also created Knockout JS, a popular JS framework that I know um, I personally used a fair amount back in the day. Um, so let's move on. You know, Guests like Daniel Roth and Chris Santi uh, from the community. I just want to interject real quick and say that I appreciate how clever of a name that is, Blazing into Summer, right? Because Summer is blazing and it's Blazer. Such a great play on words. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. Uh, we had a, a nice um, promotion that we did for a couple weeks, and we planned um, five, uh, five Twitch streams and uh, ended up being over... I'd say about eight hours of content. And uh, there's lots of really good demos in there. We started with a, an ebook that I have. There's a free ebook that you can get at telleric.com slash white papers. And it's a good introduction to all things Blazor. It'll get you up and running and, and teach you how to use the basics of the framework and learn about the component model and some of the underpinnings that are there. Uh, so the first day we covered the ebook and went over those basics to kind of get people that hadn't experienced Blazor before uh, introduced to it, or maybe kind of recap for some of the folks that checked Blazor out early on in the beta days and then are, you know, we're coming back to catch up. Uh, so that's what we did the first day. Um, the second day, we dove in a lot deeper and looked at how to do like a full stack application in C Sharp. Um, so I've got an app that has all of the UI stuff in Blazor, and then we have the backend running Entity Framework Core in Web API, 
and it's doing HTTP calls and pulling JSON into the front end and uh, doing all kinds of neat stuff with that. Um, Wednesday, we had uh, a guy that you, you might know. Um, he goes by the name Daniel Roth. You may have heard of him. So he uh, came yes. on it. <laughs> uh, again, for folks who aren't familiar with the name, Daniel Roth is the PM at Microsoft for our Blazor product. Yeah. Day and he... access to yet but I um, there's a web view that's you guys listen. do is take a on the desk Hi, entire blazer Seems like natively, but it hey. renders in the native shell. So it's kind of like a enhanced uh, Electron app that, that's way better than and more efficient than Electron. So it looks really cool. We had a little bit of uh, technical difficulties there. We, we caught the end where you said it's way better than Electron. I think that summarizes. I think that's the best part, right? It's the highlight because it's better than Electron. Yeah, so the basics of it is uh, so uh, the multi user or uh, platform that's coming with uh, six, it's getting Maui. Can you still hear me? Off and on, Ed. Off and on. Off and on. <laughs> um, it just seems like maybe it's just your audio. Um, the the internets are are blessing us today. The, they the they were, you know, the good news is I think the stream finally stabilized. So um, I, I I turned off my my quality of service uh, setting on my router and and that seems I'm gonna knock on my wood desk here. That seems better. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, Ed. Uh, we only hear like every like fifth word you're saying, which could be like a really fun game of categories or something. <laughs> All right. Picked a different word than blessing. Um, <laughs> the, the internets are not blessing us right now. They're not our friends. Um, that's okay. Yeah. We'll work through it. Can Can you guys hear me? Okay, or I can hear you now. Yeah, it seems seems All right. better. Yeah, so I'll try to I'll try to Uh, we'll we'll pop a link for the the show later, but it's it's basically on the Telerik YouTube channel. And um, so Daniel came on and talked about a Maui feature that's coming. Uh, I don't have bits for it yet, so I can't show it today. But uh, the gist of it is, you have a Maui app, which is um, a Maui app is the the next generation of .NET uh, cross platform application. Uh, so it's a shell that can run pretty much anywhere. And there is a Blazor web view that you can use in a Maui app. And you can write HTML and Razor components and all of those nice things and display them in a Maui app that's running in the native environment of your desktop. So you can get access to system resources and all of those great things inside of a Blazor app. Um, so this is like a way better version of Electron, for example. So you can still use your HTML, CSS, and, and C Sharp knowledge, but you can run it in a more native environment than you ever have been before. So that was something that he demoed on Wednesday, which was really cool. That sounds amazing. Um, and so that's what you're sharing on your screen here is uh, you're actually indicating what session that is yeah that was uh our our session with uh beyond the browser with daniel roth here um 
it was our Wednesday session. So that was that that's where you want to go look if you want to see the the new Maui stuff that uh, Daniel was demoing. Again, it was it was on release stuff, so it was really cool, and I wish I had it to test, but I don't. So. Um, let's pop that link into the chat for our viewers, that YouTube playlist that you're looking at there. Yeah, I'll send it over on uh, Skype here because I'm not sure how many channels you guys are streaming to today and how many chat rooms it belongs in. <laughs> All right. So since it's Blazor, is that entirely then based on WebAssembly? Uh, so actually, in that scenario, there is no... WebAssembly being used because uh, Blazor is not actually based on WebAssembly. Blazor's based on .NET. So Blazor can run in a .NET runtime, and one of those runtimes happens to be WebAssembly. Uh, we can also run Blazor on the server, and with Maui, it looks like we'll be able to run Blazor on the desktop. Awesome. Thank you for that clarification. Yeah, it's uh, common uh, that people associate Blazor with WebAssembly. Yeah, so I've got a good demo of that, actually. This is something we have a meetup later tonight that I'm talking about this exact thing. So I just happen to have a demo handy. This is I know this wasn't like planned or anything. But uh, um, this is a Blazor server-side application that I wrote called Blazeport. So it's like a futuristic travel, uh, like Uber-type app. Uh, but instead of taking a service from around town, you're actually like flying from the Earth to Mars and the Moon and so on. Uh, and this is a full stack Blazor application that runs server side, so no WebAssembly involved here. Uh, the cool thing about it is, first of all, the short uh, stack that it uses as far as architecture goes, because we don't need a web API in between this thing because it's running on the server where all the resources are located. Um, and it's using a lot of .NET tech so it's got ML.NET. It's using uh, Entity Framework that's uh, doing persistence against Cosmos DB. And it's able to do all this stuff because it's all part of the .NET ecosystem. And if, uh, let's say, I want to book a new trip, and let's see if uh, the internets are going to uh, cooperate with me today. We'll take a trip from the Earth, and we can launch from, say, Cape Canaveral, and we'll, we'll go to Mars, and we'll land at Mount Sharp, and we'll estimate our trip cost. And you saw how fast and responsive that was. It was instantaneous. Um, because it's running server-side, all it has to do is grab uh, the data from the form and then send back any updates to that, that UI element, which is going to be our dashboard here. And it's run the data that we put in the form through machine learning and estimated our trip price at 109000 uh, dollars. So I mean, that's pretty affordable, I think, if you call NASA and ask them. Uh, it's a pretty cheap trip. Uh, so it also t tells you how many hours and days it's going to take. And this is all kind of fictional here. But what's really neat is this estimated price actually did run through uh, a machine learning algorithm. So you're probably wondering where I got this estimated price for a travel to Mars. Well, it's, it's actually doing taxi uh, data behind the scenes. So um, when I'm going through my form and I'm picking my data, let's hit edit trip, uh, the trip distances are just being extrapolated into larger numbers right. um, to, to kind of fudge things a little bit. So this is actually like a $10.90 trip somewhere on Earth that we're, we're just adding some zeros to and having some fun with. Uh, but it is actually exercising the machine learning model that we trained with the taxi data. So it's, it's pretty cool stuff. That's clever what you did there with the taxi fare data. Um, 
before you move on any further, we do have a question in the chat for Ed, um, and it comes uh, from our friend LQDev1. The question is, are the experimental mobile bindings also considered Blazor? Are the experimental mobile bindings also Blazor? So that's an excellent question, and I don't want to speak on behalf of the Blazor team, but I'll give you my opinion of it. Um, I think uh, that all of the things that use the, the Blazor or Razor syntax to do development are going to, in uh, the Blazor framework, are going to be kind of put in that bucket. So we have uh, Blazor that we can write web applications for, uh, and then we will have Blazor that we can write MAUI applications for. And from my understanding, the Blazor mobile bindings will actually be part of MAUI at some point. So that's all going to be MAUI. Uh, and it'll still be Blazor. It's just targeting something different. Thank you for that explanation. Well, hopefully that answers your question, LQDev1. If not, let us know. Yeah, I think we'll see Blazor that we can write um, HTML with. Uh, we can swap out that templating engine with XML and do desktop applications through MAUI. And we can do uh, what they're calling Blazor mobile bindings right now and target mobile applications. But I think all of that stuff will eventually just merge into MAUI and it's just going to be .NET. And uh, I think a couple of years down the road, it'll, it'll all be uh, you know, one, one happy ecosystem. I just wanted to comment that I think this is a beautiful user interface here, like the colors and the layout and just everything about it. So well done. Thanks. Thanks. I appreciate that. I have a good designer. Who is that? Me. <laughs> <laughs> well played. Touche. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, so uh, we, we actually have some more stuff with machine learning here, too. I, I love machine learning. I think it's really cool. Um, yeah, this, I'm, I'm broadcasting at a little bit smaller screen size than normal, so this looks a little funky. But uh, we can actually pull in like all the stats from the machine learning model, and uh, we can chart those. And this is a nice... Um, usage of our, our Telerik UI for Blazor data grid. So we're taking, uh, to, to kind of explain what's happening here, let's see if I can find my zoom tool. There we go. So we've got this nice chart that's being rendered in Blazor. Um, and the markup for this is like super simple. But it's pulling test data from the machine learning model. It's running through that test data and what we're trying to figure out here is how accurate our machine learning model is. And again, this is ML.NET. So we're using the .NET framework to do all of this work. And the idea here is my accuracy of this model is, is uh, being depicted by how far off these points are uh, from the, the minimum square error line that you see in the middle. So the closer we are to this line, the more accurate we know this model is. So if we saw a bunch of dots out in this region here and here, we'd know we're not doing a really good job. But since all of our our data is clustered on this line, we know we're getting a pretty accurate reading off of our trip uh, taxi data that we're putting in to the system. Uh, so this is a nice way to use some uh, simple UI elements to take a look at your model and see how it's performing. And uh, the markup for that is super, super simple with Blazor. Um, so we've got a Teller chart, and it just has two series on it, a scatter line and a scatter. And uh, we just pump the data in uh, with a simple JSON file. So I'm taking the data that runs through the machine learning algorithm as uh, analysis data and just doing a uh, serialize. And it saves that off to a JSON file. And then on the front end, we just deserialize it. If you wanted to do this over a web, re uh, web request, you could. But since I'm on the server already, I just need to pull a little file I.O. up here and read in my, my JSON file. You can see I've got analysis.json here. We can just deserialize that back into an object with, uh, with the .NET framework and send it to a chart, and there we have our display. So, I mean, it's not like, uh, no pun, in okay, pun intended. It's not rocket science, uh, but it's... Uh, <laughs> it doesn't take a whole lot to um, do some pretty uh, advanced things with uh, the .NET framework these days, especially when you have tech like Blazor and ML.NET. 
Sure. That, you know, maybe this is taxi science and not rocket science. <laughs> I just wanted to call attention to the fact, and I, mean, I know you mentioned it, but you said file I.O., and I think that's something that we should, like, really explain a bit. So for those of you who are just joining, we're looking at a web app uh, that's using Blazor technology, but it's rendered on the server. So that means yeah. there's a, a request response pipeline that still occurs as normal, but everything, all the HTML is rendering on the server. So we can actually embed the C-sharp snippet code that actually interacts with the file system on the server. That's why you can do path dot uh, and file dot and, and, and interact with that. So it's not like that's an API uh, or a web API. Or um, So I think that's really, really cool to call attention to. Yeah, so up in the top here, you can see I've got a using statement for system IO. So we've got that right in our Razor page or component here. It's actually Razor component, even though it's a page, it's a component. Um, and then down at the bottom, uh, we're just calling the file read all line read all text async. So it's just a, a one liner and I can get all of my JSON data. Um, another thing that's really cool is just the, the .NET framework with uh, system.text.json, which is the new um, JSON serializer. Uh, we, you know, I was, I was kind of racking my brain over this for a little bit. And I, I have all this data that's in my machine learning uh, code that's in the same project here. And it reads in a CSV file. And I wanted to put all the analysis data out to consume it on the front end. And I was like, should I put that back in a CSV? And then I need to parse out the CSV file and that'll be a huge pain. And then I was like, why don't I just turn this into JSON? So I can just call serialize on, on the object and just shoot the whole object into a file and then just rehydrate it on the front end uh, by using deserialize. So I just kind of encapsulated all that behavior in, in two method calls, you know, just uh, serialize, deserialize, and I'm done, rather than go through the, the pain of processing a CSV file back and forth. Yeah, and if you tuned in to our episode a while back with uh, Steve Smith, we did talk briefly about system text JSON. You would have seen a little bit of conversation about it there. Um, if you have not seen it, just a quick recap. This is a more performant JSON serializer that ships with .NET Core, I believe as of the 3.0 or 3.1 release, one of the two. Uh, and that's what uh, Ed was just showcasing there. Yeah, another thing that's nice about this app is uh, this, this is the project, oops, over here. And you'll notice there's one main project that is the actual application itself. So this is more of a like a vertical slice architecture because we don't have a web API. And, and again, I'm talking more, more about Blazor server right now than I am Blazor WebAssembly. Uh, I don't think Blazor server gets enough uh, positive attention. It's really got some cool features to it. And this is one of the things I like is that I have this vertical architecture where I can put pretty much my whole app in one project because I don't have a web API. So there's no reason to separate that concern out. Um, I can put everything in uh, a service that's consumed right here within the app because the app and the data and everything is all running pretty much in the same place. So it's, it's a really efficient um, way to write code, especially if you have a really short time to deliver something. Uh, this is a really great way to build something extremely fast. And then if you decide you want to port it to WebAssembly later, like 98% of the code will translate over to a WebAssembly application. Pretty much the only thing that doesn't is how you're getting your data. So where we showed that IO example here, we would just turn that into an HTTP request and grab the same JSON and that code would work. So it'd be, you know, literally three lines of code we have to swap out to turn this into a WebAssembly application, at least for that view. So but let me I, ask you, uh, layout here before you go too too much further let me ask you a question that's probably on our viewers minds right now if you were mm -hmm. to start a greenfield project and you wanted to use blazer what would be your personal i guess deciding factor between blazer server or blazer web assembly what sort of uh deciding factors would you consider so there are a lot of things that you need to consider uh when it comes to um choosing the right stack to build on for Blazor. And let me pull up a little slide here because I think this kind of hits all the points uh, dead on. And let's see if I've got it here. 
Ah, here we go. So the thing with Blazor is if you're running client side, you're going to be using a RESTful API type of situation like you normally have with a um, with a Blazor or sorry, with a, a JavaScript application. So uh, it's stateless. Uh, you're relying on a web API, which is in a lot of cases a good thing. Um, people are used to building apps this way, and uh, it's pretty common these days to to build apps like this. Uh, there's a lot less overhead on the server because you're letting the client run all of the code, and maybe you want to run offline or have PWA uh, capabilities uh, built into your application. That's all things that you can do with Blazor WebAssembly. The downside to Blazor WebAssembly is that the payload for that application is going to be a bit larger than you would with server side. So with a client side Blazor application running in WebAssembly, you're going to ship for the uh, first time user hits an app, you're going to ship the entire .NET framework and your application with it. So you're going to have a payload that's about 1.7 meg. Uh, that's somewhat on the large side these days for a, a, an a, a web application. So you're going to see a little bit of a, um, you know, a, a file overhead there. Um, and then RESTful APIs are great, but having a disconnected environment like that, again, I, I kind of iterated on this earlier, your stack is going to be inflated a bit because you're going to need that middle layer of a web API that's talking to your database and then turning things into JSON. Um, so you kind of have to manage your web API layer uh, with things like, um, what's that uh, tool called again? It's slipping my mind now. Um, shoot, there, there's some really good stuff for managing your, your APIs, though. Uh, we'll take a look at it in a minute. I've got another project here. Are you trying to think uh, of uh, Swash? Yes, Swashbuckle and Swagger. Yeah, so so those things help you, but you still have to manage all that stuff. Uh, with server-side Blazor, the payload size is extremely small because all you're doing is setting up a SignalR connection with your client. So the boot sequence for that is the client receives an HTML page and a little bit of JavaScript and maybe some CSS code. And maybe the initial page HTML that's rendered. So you've got, you know, just a couple K, you know, 20K worth of data that comes across the wire. And then the SignalR connection takes place and it only re-renders portions of the page where it needs to update the UI. Uh, so there, there's a lot uh, more efficiency um, with a server-side application um, as far as uh, payload size. Uh, there's a lot less abstraction. Well, you were talking about like one point, you said five or seven megs for the, the larger payload. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not uncommon to see, you know, like Angular applications, for example, which is another SPA framework, uh, but it, it's done entirely in JavaScript that are 1.5 megs. I mean, I've got several now, and I just went and actually checked because I was curious. And that's, you know, the initial page load is, is 1.5 megs. So it's, it's it's pretty much on par at its heaviest here. Yeah, uh, the thing with the Angular and React is those things, especially Angular, is more heavier, I think, than React. But they're clever at hiding it. So what they do is they can fragment the the code up to where it like lazy loads in um i can't remember the term that they use for it but you, you basically chunk up the javascript and it loads kind of what you need um for the the view that you're looking at and then it will lazy load in some of that that javascript as you go along uh, so it does have some ways of dealing with that uh but yeah they can get quite large um you know you're shipping a lot of uh, javascript across the wire to do all the things that that your WebAssembly app is doing. So uh, the, the trade-off, uh, you know, you're going to see that large payload size, like even with the smallest like Hello World app, uh, whereas with an Angular app, you won't see it until you're, you've kind of like baked the project um, and it's going to kind of expand in size over time uh, where the, the Blazor application is not really going to change that much once you have the initial code written um, or the, you know, the .NET framework is the big chunk. Like your your assemblies that are custom, your stuff that you're writing for your app are, you know, going to be less than probably 200K. You know, so 
Yeah, this makes me think of another conversation we could start here closely related to this. Um, I commonly hear from folks looking at Blazor for the first time that they're moving there so that they can escape the hell that is the JavaScript ecosystem. And specifically, I think what they're referring to there in that pain point is the tooling that comes along with that ecosystem, primarily Node.js and NPM. And I think, you know, I bring this up because I, I recall Ed had a slide in this very deck about that point that I'm just making. So, you know, you could look at it this way. Um, as a .NET developer, you're familiar with NuGet, you feel at home there. So maybe Blazor is a better choice than say, you know, an Angular application. Uh, what are your thoughts on that, Ed? Yeah, so this uh, heavily depends on where you're happy. Um, are you more efficient with .NET libraries, or do you like NPM packages? Um, are you comfortable configuring Webpack? Uh, a lot of Webpack is abstracted away these days, and then you run into a point where you need to, quote, eject uh, your JavaScript application, and then you are in configuration nightmares. So Webpack, uh, if you if you like Webpack, good for you. Um, if you're in that camp, then then maybe that's something you like. Um, I'm more efficient with C Sharp in the fact that it's a compiled language, and it has a lot of IntelliSense features that you just can't replicate even with TypeScript and JavaScript. Uh, so for me, all these things mean, you know, this is this is my happy place. So I'm going to pick Blazor. Um, if this is more your speed and you're primarily a JavaScript developer, then by all means, you know, grab React or, or Angular. So it's it's a matter of choice here and what type of technologies you're more efficient with and how you can build apps the fastest. And going back to the discussion uh, real quick about um, you know, choosing client side versus server side. How big of a how big of a uh, of a server impact is it when we when we do server side Blazor? I mean, ASP.NET Core is really super efficient on on server resources. So I'm I'm wondering, has anybody ever made a server fall down with server side Blazor? Uh, that's something I'm not too aware of. I know. Um... If you guys ping Dan, he's got some resources on, uh, it may actually be in your docs too. Uh, so let me know if it's there. But there there was some performance testing that was done from uh, the Microsoft's perspective and uh, kind of gives you uh, what to expect from Blazor scenarios running in, I think, Azure. Um, so that's something I, I, I don't recall. I've read it, but I don't recall what the, the actual stats are. Uh, but I know that it runs very efficiently on the .NET runtime. Um, and when you're on the server, you can see these pages come across the wire just immediately. Uh, again, it's going to be based on your latency. But if you have low latency, I mean, this stuff is uh, it's fast as fast can get. Cool. Um, hey, I wanted to get back, not to do, not to uh, distract from this conversation, but there was a really good question in our um, chat window from LQDev1. And this actually came up, I think, in our previous episode with Corey Weathers, but let's address it again. And the question is, how do you decide, Ed, whether to um, embed your Blazor component code in the code directive or move it to a separate CS file? Uh, so you're talking about code behind uh, the type of approach that you'd use for um, exactly. building any, any web component, really. Uh, Angular does this. Uh, if you remember back to the web forms days, uh, I think that's one of the places you hear that name used a lot, that code behind terminology. Uh, so you'll see that I uh, I kind of have it mixed both ways in this project that I'm, I'm using here. Um, for example, this page, something I recently coded up, so I generally start in this type of format. Um, I've only got one method here and one field, so it's not like there's a lot to be moving around and putting in a code behind. So I find that this is fine for building a small component or page, and it doesn't have a lot of um, logic going on. But in something that's a lot larger, like the index page, for example, I've got um, quite a bit of code behind in this page. 
And this is actually even using uh, some dependency injection here and a, uh, kind of like a model view presenter type of a pattern. So I've actually got like multiple forms and things that come up in this page. Uh, and you'll see that is actually split out into an additional folder even. So I have my trip configuration form. So if we get a little visual here, if we go back to our initial page and I click on edit trip, I've got an entire view that pops up here that has a form uh, that has a component that is split out with a code behind as well. So these things can kind of nest and uh, have a hierarchy. And that index page uses this trip configuration. And you can see there's multiple components just underneath of that trip configuration. And this is where that vertical slice architecture takes place. And instead of having like a controller with all of the actions and everything, since I'm, I'm, on, I'm on server side Blazor, um, I have everything that I need for my home page boxed into this one folder. And um, all of my components are in here that run my trip configuration, the countdown that you see displayed when I uh, commit to a trip, uh, even the, the component that, that renders the passenger count and the trip time and all of that are underneath of this home directory here. So I've got a nice uh, way to find all of the components that are seen on that, that home, uh, that index page. So everything that you see here, you'll find in that home page. And to answer the question more directly, the, the second these things get probably beyond where I can view them in one single page, I start splitting them out into code behind files. So you'll see the trip configuration form has quite a bit of markup on it. Uh, that's not one there. That's, uh, that's actually using the view model. But we've got, uh, let's see, I'll go back to the index page. Because uh, this one, it's got quite a bit of markup and then there's about 35 lines of code. Uh, so I've got this split out into two files so I can manage everything really easily. Uh, so anytime there's a bit of um, context switching or, or a lot of uh, code to dig through, a lot of markup, I split those things out. So usually, I mean, just to recap, it's kind of like an organic process where you start off kind of uh, with, with uh, embedding the code snippet right in the components. And then as it starts to evolve and you start developing more, uh, if it makes sense, that's when you decide consciously to kind of separate it. Yeah, I'll I'll outline one more um, point here too. So uh, this is a little bit of a tooling issue, and it's not a big one, but Ra Razor is actually a very complex templating engine. Uh, so there's some things that just don't work well in the IDE with it. Uh, so, for example, if I write a method call that doesn't exist because I haven't had the proper using statement uh, added to the page, um, if I hit control period in your normal C sharp workload, you're going to get IntelliSense that says you need to add a using statement, press enter. So, you, you know, you kind of get in this habit of going through your code. You see a red squiggly, you hit control period, hit enter, and a magic using statement shows up and that red squiggle goes away, right? That doesn't work in Razor. Uh, so if you are running into a place where you, you know, trying to import a bunch of using statements and stuff, and you're, you're kind of uh, feeling yourself slow down, and uh, you need that extra uh, IDE help, you get switched to a code behind, and the code behind will pick those up because it's just a normal CSS file or CS file. So you can see in uh, trip.razor here, um, if I were to take out, for example, uh, let's let's grab that out of there let's see now you can see i've got some red under squiggles here i can hit control period press enter and my using statement just magically comes back if i'm in a razor view i don't get that extra help a little bit faster if you have the code behind files from the get-go that out ed because what you just described is the sole reason why I prefer the code behind approach. So I have the the support of the tooling in Visual Studio. Um, you know, the control period experience to resolve um, some API that I'm using is, you know, that's why I use Visual Studio to begin with. Yeah, so for example, in the Razor code, if I take off this using statement here, you'll see something eventually blow up. Uh, Razor, Razor is a little bit more complex than just regular C-sharp code. We have 
both HTML, well, actually, there's many things. There's HTML, CSS, and there's uh, C Sharp code all existing in the same place. So you've got IntelliSense for HTML, IntelliSense for CSS, and some IntelliSense for C Sharp. Um, you can see I've got this here. And if I hit control period, it really just doesn't know what context we're looking at. Uh, so it doesn't know how to resolve it. And uh, it won't add the using statement for me. So I just kind of did a control Z to undo there and get that to go away. Uh, but I don't have as much um, benefit from the IDE in here as I normally would because it's mixing so many different technologies together. Uh, we hope to have that someday and, and be able to, to have this, you know, uh, functionality at parity with a C sharp uh, file, but it's just not there. Out of curiosity, what are your thoughts on like the at using data? Because uh, if you go back to like the actual code behind file, you have to have like a semicolon to terminate that that expression, right? So why, uh, you know, there's there's no semicolons required, and I know it's part of the Razor engine, but I'm just more or less curious about how you feel about that. Kind of disconnect because it's it's like it's treating it like c sharp it picks it up as c sharp it compiles as c sharp but then the syntax is slightly different yeah this one catches me quite a bit um so it's it's one of those context switching things that you got have to get used to so one of the things i'll have is um sometimes i'll have a, a method call in here um uh, let's see what's uh what's something like if i have my view model dot uh, let's just grab any property off here. I'll I'll throw one of the um, semicolons here at the end, forgetting that I'm I'm in the razor world, and you'll you'll end up just having semicolons floating around in your display when you're done. So <laughs> this gets evaluated as as uh, C sharp code, and then it has a literal semicolon that shows up in the UI. Let's see, I'm on the trip configuration. You'll probably just see it floating out there. I've done that countless times, and so thank you for not, you know, making me feel so alone. <laughs> yeah, you're not alone, Dave. You. Yeah, you could see I've got uh, actually it rendered the whole object, but I've got a semicolon. It's probably hard to see on the stream, but there's just a semicolon just floating right off the end of the data output there. So you'll see these dumb semicolons or or a parentheses or uh, a set of curly braces just you know rendered out in your your display and you're just like, ah, <laughs> yeah, that's razor. That's one of the downsides. Uh, you just got to go in and clean that stuff up, but it's also not nice to not have closing tags on everything. Right? So if you're used to like angular, you know, you miss, you miss one of these sets of uh, closing braces and in the whole, you know, earth comes to a pause. Um, I, I kind of prefer not having to specify all of these things and let Razor do its magic and uh, determine the closing, um, you know, cutoff for the template. Right. That's sort of like playing a, a developer's version of Jenga. You pull out a handlebar and all of a sudden the entire app breaks and you have no idea what just happened. Uh, Blazor saves us from that scenario and many others, in fact. Um, but, but hey, I wanted to also ask about uh, the hosting story for a Blazor server app. I realize we haven't talked much about that. Um, so there is this service out there called Azure SignalR service. And it's something that you would uh, you know, provision when you deploy a Blazor server app to production. Say you deploy it to Azure app service. SignalR service is something you might want to consider using. Um, as sort of a proxy, or I guess you could even call it a backplane. Um, have you done much with that, Ed? Um, I I demoed it like way back in the early beta days of Blazor, um, and what it, what really surprised me is how easy it was to set up. Uh, so you basically go in and provision the service in Azure, which is just like a wizard thing that you click through. So it's like two or three steps, and you're off and running, and you have your service. And then on the um, on the app side of things, in I think it's in your startup, you just go into configure services or configure. I can't remember which location it is. I think it's configure, and you just add it an app dot using in here that targets that service. And all of a sudden, all of your um, 
your signal R connections are rerouted through that service. And it's kind of like hands off at that point. You only you know put that one configuration piece in and your whole app is now routed through Azure and, and has the performance of this huge backplane. And you don't have to, you know, kind of build all that stuff and manage it yourself. It's uh, it's pretty amazing that you just put like one line of code in and it just lights up the whole app for that. It's magic. Yeah. And, you know, I bring that up because earlier we were talking about distinctions between Blazor Server and Blazor WebAssembly. Well, with Blazor Server, behind the scenes, you've got this signal R connection that's needed um, to maintain the updates in the, the document object model. Whereas, you know, my understanding is in Blazor WebAssembly, Sig signal R has been completely removed from that picture. Yeah, you're not you're not using signal R on the uh, WebAssembly. Um, I mean, you can use it, but it's it's not doing the same functionality there as it is with the server uh, Blazor. So Blazor server is actually uh, using that signal R pipeline to do um, events and updates. Um, if you're using WebAssembly, it's more of uh, something that you have to opt into. Maybe you're um, subscribing to some kind of service on the back end and automatically updating the UI for the user. If uh, you know you're building like a stock ticker or something that's got real time data, uh, so you can use it on WebAssembly. You just uh, you need to opt into that. And I believe there's an SDK for it now. I haven't checked in a while. You used to have to use a JavaScript interop to get to SignalR from WebAssembly. But I think there's actually a library you can pull in now. Uh, yeah, Fowler confirmed with me because I had asked him on Twitter about this, and he said that the .NET SDK for SignalR is supported in WebAssembly. Nice, very nice. It used to not be, so that's a big change and a very positive one. So another another nice thing that I've got uh, to demo for you guys is uh, a question that we get a lot at Progress. Uh, so people want to know with a Blazor WebAssembly application, um, if you have, say, a lot of data on the back end, uh, and you know you're paging and sorting and filtering all of that data, uh, how do you keep your application efficient, uh, both on the server and the client? And uh, we've got an answer for that with our our Teller components and our data grid. Bring the zoom level back up here so you guys could see real well. Uh, so this is like one of the questions we get asked the most. And this data grid here is showing, uh, it's only showing 7,000 records, but there's a total of 20,000 records in this database. And what we don't want to do is pull all 20,000 records down the wire um, and try to put them in a data grid. And we're only showing, you know, 10, 20 items at a time anyway. So why would we pull 20,000 records to do that. Uh, another thing is we don't want to waste a bunch of uh, SQL cycles, you know, querying all that data when we only need 10 records of it. So uh, one of the things that we do is we leverage Entity Framework, and we actually have a, um, a nice little extension method that packages all this stuff up for us. So with the Telerik data grid, I can say uh, I can enable all the paging and sorting and filtering and all of that. But when I call a um, a read, let's see. Oh, I've got the wrong wrong code file. That's why I can't quite find it. Let me go over to pages again. Oop, pages on the client. Um, on my sales report view here, I've got a read items task here. And you'll see it's sending up something called argument.request. And what this is, is the, it's the uh, grid event arguments. So whenever the grid, like I change a page, for example, this event kicks off and it says, I need to read some items. And it passes the state of that grid to this method. Then we can pass that state back up to the server. So the server knows the state of all the filtering and sorting and page um, characteristics of that data grid. And then on the server side, this is just magic right here. I love this. Uh, on the sales controller, where it gets the data from, I'm going to look for a data source request object, which is that data, data grid's uh, state information. And then I'm going to call an extension method on it that's to data source results async and pass that object in. This little extension method here is just magic. It turns that data source request, that grid state, 
into the proper um, uh, uh, expression trees that Entity Framework can then use to create the most efficient SQL uh, command out of that data. So this one line right here takes all of that paging, sorting, and filtering data and processes it into a SQL command and gets that 10 records that I need in only those 10 records. And it gets the total count of the results and passes that back to my application to be displayed on that page. So this is really cool stuff that um, we've, we've actually been using this with the JavaScript in the past with our Kendo UI components. Uh, so it's been around since like ASP.NET Core 3, I think. Uh, so it's something that we've used for a long time and we got to kind of retool for Blazor. And uh, it makes, you know, not only your client efficient because it's only processing 10 records, but it makes your SQL server more efficient and your, your backend more efficient. That's awesome. That's really impressive. And I'm a huge fan of extension methods, especially when they're async. So kudos. Yeah, this is this is one that people ask about a lot because it's you know very common scenario to have tons and tons of data that people want to you know filter and and page through, and uh, we can easily represent that in a simple UI. And uh, for example, if I wanted to grab uh, a certain element out of here, like um, let's see if it's uh, equal to a bagel, when I grab all the the sales information for bagels out. I just click on the filter and there it is in my UI. And again, I'm only showing 10 out of 367 records. If I go back to my application, see if I can find the right page here. We've got diagnostics that so, come out. Ed, uh, sorry to interrupt. Uh, there's a question in the chat. There seems to be some confusion as to whether this solution that you're showing off is using Blazor server or not. Oh, sorry. Yeah, this is Blazor WebAssembly. Uh, so I switched gears a little bit. This is Blazor WebAssembly. So again, we have that RESTful API type of uh, behavior. So and we see client and server, right? So that's that's mm -hmm. kind of like the standard share approach. Yeah, so these two pieces right here are what's doing all of the work. We've got our sales.razor, which is our front-end WebAssembly display, and our back-end sales controller. Uh, and it's backed by NAD Framework and uh, SQLite database. Um, and what happens here is we, we call this read method from the grid. Uh, for example, when I clicked on that filter, this read method got called. Post is JSON async got passed over to this uh, API here. And all of that grid state got consumed by this extension method and turned into an NAD Framework query um, just with that one line of code. And then if we look at our output, this is really neat. I've turned this on. This is not something you want to do in production, uh, just for the record. But this is showing what SQL code got generated from Entity Framework uh, by that uh, filter that I just ran. And Drop tables. <laughs> <laughs> if we look in here, yeah, there we go. So you'll see actually two queries. See if I can get the right zoom level where you can catch it all. Um, there's two queries here, and the reason for that is we want to do a count, and uh, not getting it all right here, but there we go. So you'll see the first query is actually doing a select count star, and that's going to be the best way to get a count of all the records that are affected by the filters that we put in. And you can actually see the bagel come through here as well. If you turn on the right features and in, in your logging, you can see this. Again, don't publish that to production with those. Uh, those logging capabilities enabled. It's not a good thing to have on your server running in production. Uh, the second query actually grabs all the data. And there you can see the bagel again. And then you can see this one. This is limit and offset. And that's actually doing the paging. So it's it's determining which page we're on and only grabbing 10 records at a time. Beautiful. That's awesome. So you, you get all that Perfect. out of one extension. <laughs> You know, if you are interested in the logging of the SQL commands that Ed was just showcasing, uh, we do actually have a Microsoft Learn module that shows you how to enable that. Um, Cam, I don't recall which one it is off the top of my head. Do you remember? Uh, it's the our Entity Framework module. I just put the link out in the chat for the viewers. 
And you can also catch it here in um, in the project that I'm working on, which is on GitHub. Uh, so this is going to be uh, github.com. And we're under Blazing Coffee at, at the Telerik repo. I'll share that with you guys here so you can spam it, chat. Uh, so you can look in into this as well. And if you look at the context, the DB context for it, which is called coffee context in this app, you'll see it's on the on the on configuring method in here. So I've kind of hard coded it in here. You might want to put that in your options um, on your startup.cs, but I've kind of put it in the on configuring method here, which is also valid. Uh, and I'm using uh, a console logger and enabling sensitive data logging. Uh, and again, there's there's notes in here to you know don't put that in the production, but it's great for debugging. Awesome. So yeah, as Ed said, don't try that particular thing at home. Uh, proceed with caution, or you you may hurt yourself. Um, and push it to production. The YOLO push, as we at like five thirty. Hey, so Ed, this has been great so far. Hey, we've got a couple of minutes left. Are there any closing thoughts you wanted to leave the viewers with? Um, if you're trying to learn uh, Blazor and you want to know more about it, I've got a free ebook. It's at telerk.com slash white papers. If you just click on the Blazor beginner's guide here, um, you'll get uh, the sign up page. I'll paste the direct link here in uh, the uh, chat. So so it can be shared. Uh, that's a great starting point. Uh, we also have the YouTube videos. That I think we shared the link to earlier, but it's uh, youtube.com uh, slash Telerik, and you'll, you can find Blazing into Summer with Telerik there. And um, we've got videos on the, the app that I just showed, this Blazing Coffee app that has authentication and um, the server client behaviors. Lots of data grids, CRUD operations with um, uh, uh, processing of um, doc files into PDFs. There's all kinds of really neat gems inside of that app. So make sure you check that out. And of course, the, the, um, the docs page uh, that you guys work on is a great starting point as well. Uh, there's some really good stuff in the just general Blazor documentation and like the Blazing Pizza Workshop and stuff like that. It's awesome. Thank you so much. I, I just wanted to extend like a, a personal thank you because I know that there's been plenty of times where I've relied on you for help, like <laughs> through uh, through Twitter, like direct messages, like I need help right now. I don't know how to do this blazer thing. And uh, you've been really responsive. Um, so uh, I'm assuming others who are watching, they might be able to hit you up on Twitter as well if they have questions. Yep. My name, uh, which is hopefully in the show here somewhere because it's hard to spell. Uh, you can also go to blazerpro.com and that should redirect you to my website where you can find all my links to my Twitch show that I do every Friday um, and my, my Twitter information and all that stuff. Very cool. I'd also like to thank you for your time, Ed. Um, I think that's all the time we had for today's episode. Uh, thank you very much to all the viewers for tuning in today, and we will see you next week. And who's the guest that we have on for next week? Um, is it Heather Downing? Yep, Heather Downing. Excited to have her on. She's awesome. Yeah. In Heather's fact, uh, she was the closing keynote uh, in uh, Bulgaria, wasn't it? Yeah, she... Uh... Breach, yeah. That's right. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. Thank you again so much. And Thanks. see you Appreciate guys next that. week. See you guys next week.